Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can trust in a living hope. We thank you that no matter what's going on around us, whether it be the craziness in Ukraine or the uh, economic issues here or just whatever may be happening in our daily lives, we can lean on you. Now as we transition from worshiping you through singing your praises to worshiping you through opening your word, would you be with us? Would you remove distractions, whether they be something that might happen here, a strange noise, a tech glitch, or more importantly, what we brought with us today? Something in our hearts and our minds that might pull our attention away from truly listening to you, because that's what we want. We want to hear from you. We want to hear from your word. We want to know how to properly understand it and apply it to our daily lives so that we can walk out of here more like you. We want to drink from the fountain that is your wisdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. We've had a few missionaries in the past little bit, and next week we'll have another missionary, but I'm excited that we get a kind of appropriate gap in the text with Nehemiah. So I am experiencing some pro-presenter difficulties. Here we go. Got it. So forgive that. But we've been studying through Nehemiah, and we're going to come from a time where he's focused on building the wall, where we kind of have a pause. So since last week we heard from a missionary, and next week we're going to hear from a missionary, this kind of pause is appropriate for us as well. So we get to take a peek at something besides just the wall in Nehemiah. Let me begin with a question for you guys. Have you ever played Jenga, right? This is an easy game. You probably have heard of it, even if you haven't played it. It's one of those where you stack those building blocks we all played with as kids up, and you pull one from the bottom or towards the bottom, and you put it on the top, adding more weight and making the tower less and less stable. And really, the whole purpose is to eventually see the tower collapse. And that's one of the funnest parts for kids. You know, not only do you get to build things up, but you get to see all those things fall down in a nice, you know, collapse and tower. And it happens really suddenly. And, you know, that's the person who loses, the one who causes that. Uh, But it's the exact opposite of how we build things. If we were to go and look underneath a building at all the, the, the supports that hold up, the bottom of a building underneath where all those weight-bearing pillars are, and we would found one that was cracked or broken, we wouldn't immediately knock it down and then add that weight to the top of the building, right? Because then we have fewer supports and we're just making it harder for the remaining supports to do their job. No, we would, we would build up around it. We would protect it. Maybe we would fix it or repair it or put something beside it to ultimately replace it rather than just knock it down. Now, Nehemiah, he's going to come and he is looking at how to rebuild the wall, as I've spoken already, because he wants to, among other things, support the foundation of the city of Jerusalem as they have kind of terraced out building up on this mountain uh, in such a way that the walls actually prevent the city from eroding. But also, of course, he doesn't want their success to erode. They've got a new temple. They've got a city actually there when there was none once upon a time. And so he wants that protected from their political enemies and bandits and things like that that might come in to the city. But Nehemiah, he's in the middle of this massive construction project, and he's trying to work together with the whole community on this. But in chapter 5, we're going to see he's going to have to pause his main goal and what his passion is to do something more foundational even than the physical foundation. Now, as we go about and we do a project, we might encounter different ways of doing different types of projects. Doing a puzzle is fairly easy. You look at the thing on the box, the picture of the finished product, and you can kind of begin where you want. Grouping pictures together or, you know, kind of common colors together, and it'll help you start in any order that you want. Although I'd recommend starting kind of with the edge, right? The foundation helps there too. But you can put it together, not in a specific order, but some things you do need to follow a specific order. Like Lego, for example. There's my kids at Lego Land here in California uh, with a giant spider that Liliana is way too excited about compared to her brother. But to build a Lego, my kids can tell you, you need to follow orders uh, in the way that the instructions go. If you follow that things that are in the inside that may not even appear on the finished product might be necessary. You can't just look at the finished product and start from there. And things will need to go together in certain ways. And so we're going to find that sometimes we 
don't do things in the right order as we try to solve a problem. Uh, Have you ever heard the phrase, put the cart before the horse? Now, back in the day, horses used to draw carts and buggies. And they did this, you know, before gas-powered cars and things like that. And the carts were designed to be pulled by the horse. Well, the phrase is the cart before the horse because it wasn't designed to work like that. You've got things backwards. And we might need to know more about carts and horses with how high gas prices are rising. We may need to revisit that method of travel soon. But We want to make sure that we deal with things in the proper order. So it's not just like a puzzle piece and make it match. So often in life when we're trying to do a project, it needs to be done correctly. And when we discover something in the midst of that process, we might find that we have to pause and go back a few steps and start at the beginning. You know, if you are mounting something on a wall and you drill a pre-drill hole in, and you discover that your wood is rotten on that beam you were going to mount everything in, you don't just go forward and address it later and go ahead and mount maybe that TV up on the wall. No, that's going to add more weight. That's going to tear it down. No, you have to, you have to stop what you're doing. You have to switch gears, and you have to replace or fix that rotten weight-bearing load. And so Nehemiah is going to find the same thing happening. He is there in Jerusalem and he has a passion. He wants this one specific thing to happen. He wants to rebuild the wall. This is why he's here. He wants to protect the people. But he's going to find that even though that's why he was called there, he can't actually do that yet. He's going to have to pause. As you know, the words will be up here on the screen. For those of you that are here, those of you that are watching online, it's down at the bottom. But Here or online, I invite you to open your own copy of Scripture so you can follow along and read and even maybe make a note in the margin as the Holy Spirit imparts something to you. Now, there was a great outcry of the people and of their wives against the Jewish brothers. For there were those who said, We are sons and our daughters are many. Therefore, let us get grain that we may eat and live. There were others who said, we are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our houses that we may get grain because of the famine. And there were those who said, we have borrowed money for the king's tax on our fields and our vineyards. Now our flesh is like the flesh of our brothers, our children like their children. Yet behold, we are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves. We're going to talk more about that word and what it means in their context in a minute. And some of our daughters are forced into bondage already. This would be like forced to marry for money purposes. And we are helpless because our fields and vineyards belong to others. So Nehemiah's whole mission is involved a community effort getting them together. And it's really going to be hard for the community to work together to build this wall when The community is full of people who might sell someone into slavery for their own benefit. How can you work beside people on a wall when you have to keep your eyes kind of looking over your shoulder to see if your brother or your sister who should be helping you might actually be out to get you? So he's going to have to pause and address something deeper first. Now, I realize that there's a lot like that in life. We, we join people in the midst of something that's already ongoing. Nehemiah may not have been aware of all these problems, but he had to deal with them as he uncovers them. I encourage you, as you meet people, try to remember that as you meet them, they've already had a life. They're already on a spiritual journey. And so they, the way they interact with you might be influenced, probably is influenced, but maybe perhaps in a negative way from something you have no knowledge of that happened in their past. And you just have to kind of roll with it and find them where they are, right? Give some grace as you would appreciate others giving grace to you. But even in the way that we come together as a church, a church body, new Christians don't always get to start at the beginning. I mean, we do chapter by chapter, verse by verse here. Normally, you know, I know that sometimes people miss a a section. You kind of have to go and you have to fill in that past context as we are going along. And so we don't get everything from the beginning, or in a perfectly neat order because we all have different starting points. Well, depending on how you find people in their starting point, they might have a different need at that point in their journey. There was a gentleman by the name of Abraham Maslow, and in 1943, he wrote a paper called A Theory of Human Motivation in the Journal of Psychological Review. Now, what Maslow did is he he really organized what was largely already recognized about people's behavior. People have a kind of a series of priorities that they go into. For example, 
you know, the, what is the most immediate things are like food, water, warmth, rest. These things are going to be a priority for somebody who doesn't have them over making friends, for example. So think about that. If you walk upon somebody, you know, we encourage that you would organically outreach to those people around you. You walk upon somebody on the sidewalk and they're on the ground with a broken leg. While I really want you to share the gospel with everybody that you encounter, probably at that point, if you just pulled out a track or opened your Bible and started sharing the gospel with them, they're not going to listen because they're in intense pain. You probably need to get them to the hospital first and then show them how you care, build a relationship, then you can share the gospel, right? We don't want to put the cart before the horse. We have to meet people where they are just as Jesus met people where they are. Now, we have to be careful with this. Missionaries have known this for a long time. That's why they feed people. That's why they help those that are in, in need and in poor. Sometimes there is this error where we focus on that stage and we forget to bring them to Jesus. We, yes, God is glorified in that we're taking care of people, that we're, we're showing his love to people. But if we don't actually tell them why we're doing it, if we don't actually introduce them to Jesus, well, we're missing it. We're missing the connecting point to getting them to the God that they need. And Jesus has something to say about that. Let's look at the Samaritan woman at the well in John chapter 4. He, he's going to talk about her physical, temporary need, but also something more eternal that should inspire us to think long-term in our relationships. John 4, 13, Jesus answered and said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. This didn't stop Jesus from healing people or feeding people. But he looked on them compassion like a sheep without a shepherd. Scripture records that. But all of these miracles, they all had an end goal, which was to help them understand who Jesus really was. So he met them right where they were but he didn't leave them there. So as we help people in our daily life, you know, I think of the the homeless problem in Visalia. You know, it's one thing to help somebody by handing them a few bucks or giving them a meal, but really we don't want to help them to stay where they are. They're going to get hungry again. They're going to get thirsty again. We want to help them go past where they are and meet deeper needs. But we do very often have to meet those surface level needs first, right? So that we can deal with that. Nehemiah, he's going to have to deal with something deeper. And many of you who are are married or have been married, you know that sometimes what the argument is about on the surface really is a symptom of something deeper in there. This was stalling the project that God had called them to do because, yeah, they needed to be working on the wall, but really there was some deep-seated issues that needed to be dealt with first before they could be effective. So Nehemiah, he's not going to be narrowly over-focused on this one thing. He's going to understand that, you know, sometimes as we uncover a problem, we have to pause and step back, even if it delays our current project, even if something we're very passionate about. We need to pause, step back, and figure out what's going on underneath the surface so that we can deal with things properly. And Nehemiah, he is going to have a response to hearing about all this. Now, I I did want to mention the word slavery. We read that they were selling people into slavery. In the Hebrew culture, in the Old Testament, usually the word that is translated slave really should be indentured servant to be accurate. When we think slavery, we think American slavery. Well, most cultures across the history of the world has had some kind of slavery. The Hebrew indentured servant had rights, right? It wasn't racially based and even had in terms. So eventually they could make an agreement, I will serve you for X amount of years and then maybe I'll get a parcel of land or a spouse or some goats or some, something like that. It was more in line with a, uh, a more serious job contract than American slavery. But we're going to see that's not all that's in view here. We're going to see there's more. And even the way marriages were arranged, an arrangement of a marriage might be so that, you know, they would get money back for giving away a bride. And they did arrange. They didn't just go on dates. They might get money back for going on a bride because that would replace the work that was being done in the home. They might be making these arrangements, or clearly they were making these arranged marriages so that they got that money early, So they go ahead and use it because their taxes were high. There was a famine mentioned. And so costs were really high and they were struggling to survive. So they were focusing on how do I survive in the moment? And we're not able to plan long term. 
And Nehemiah is going to respond to all these things because he sees that they're taking advantage of one another rather than working together for everyone's good. Verse 6, Then I was very angry when I heard their outcry and these words. I consulted with myself and contended with nobles and the rulers and said to them, you are exacting usury. Not a word we use very often, but think of a, um, think of interest uh, or ha- holding collateral of items. Each from his brother. Therefore, I held a great assembly against them. Now, I've got to pause here. There's several things going on. Nehemiah is going to respond with, it says, I was angry. Now, he's going to consult with himself. You know, that means he's going to think things through, which is a good thing to do. We need to do that before we start talking and responding with pure emotion. But he did have emotion. Sometimes there is this Christian idea that it's a little naive. It's a, a cursory reading of Scripture, and it seems to be that, well, we're not supposed to be angry, so angry is, is always bad. Not necessarily. Now, we are warned that we should not let the sun go down on our wrath. We are warned that when we are angry, we are close to sinning. But not all anger in and of itself is automatically sinful. In fact, there are some things that should make you angry, right? Like, I'm so thankful, praise the Lord, that some demonstrations, some intense prayer got Planned Parenthood to not be on Mooney, right? Now they might find somebody else or that will, as a business, rent to them or lease to them or, or sell property to them or whatever. But I have dealt with so many folks that have been hurt after they realized what they've done that I don't want more of that hurt here in Visalia. It does make me angry. And so it takes me to the Lord in prayer because I don't want more people in the office crying. I don't want more young babies not being born. And I certainly don't want those things done when a company that's supposedly a nonprofit is profiting billions as they harm people. So it does make me angry. Well, Nehemiah here is angry at this because people are being hurt. You know, the, we shouldn't be apathetic to people's plights in Ukraine or, or even around the world. But it should lead us to prayer. It should lead us to thoughtful action. And sometimes it needs to lead us to confronting issues. Paul warned Timothy that eventually people wouldn't tolerate good doctrine. What that means is, you know, truth properly explained. But instead would gather together people that would just tickle their ears. You know, tell them what they want to hear. So much, uh, so very often when we're looking for our news media, when we're looking for a book to read, even when we're looking for a church as Christians, but certainly looking maybe for a community when we're not a Christian, we're looking for someone who will tell us what we already believe. We want to hear our ideas in their mouth to reaffirm us rather than actually be confronted with reality. Nehemiah isn't afraid here to confront them with reality. And he's going to do so uh, tactically. He's going to do so lovingly, but he's going to call them out on their wrong deeds. And I think Sometimes in today's culture, this would be seen as, oh, he's dividing things or he's, he's being too harsh or something like that. No, he's angrily going to call them together and he's going to let them have it, but in an appropriate way. Exodus 22, 25 through 27. I'm not going to read all these. Leviticus 25, 35 through 47. Deuteronomy 23, 19 through 20 and 24, 10 through 13. All prohibited Israelites from doing this kind of thing. From holding on saying, I'll give you a loan, but I have to hold on to your coat. Or I have to hold on to your property. Or if you fail to do it, it'll be mine. Now, we live in a society that is very much based on interest. It's very different. Now, what was in view here in the Levitical covenant in, in Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy was more personal loans, not what we would consider business loans. Uh, and so I'm thankful I don't have to deal with that because I'm not giving out loans like that. But the concern here was not taking advantage of somebody who has a momentary need to gain from their need and enrich yourself, but instead helping those around you. So they were told they were not allowed to do this. If they were going to give to somebody, it wasn't to get something else back later or to profit from themselves. It was to help that person. And unfortunately, they looked around and some of the people with stuff, they said, you know, life's pretty hard. Life's pretty difficult. I could make some money. Sure, I'll loan you, but what's in it for me? Not how can I help you, but what's in it for me? And that's what they were doing, and it was causing the already difficult financial situation of many to get worse. And so he's stirred up to action to this, and this is what he says in verse 8. I said to them, 
we, according to our ability, have redeemed our Jewish brothers who were sold to the nations. Now, would you even sell your brothers that they may be sold to us? What Nehemiah reveals here is that our early word would be referring to indentured slavery that was common among the Jewish people, or indentured servanthood, making a long-term arrangement. But what we see here is that there were some people who ended up owning folks in the indentured servanthood kind of sense, but then sold them to outside peoples. The Jewish indentured servanthood was someone with rights. There was an in term, but they straight up sold them outside to other cultures where there was no in term, where they did not have rights, where they were slaves for their own benefit. Oh, you can't pay me back? You're mine. Or your kids are mine. And they're, they're starting out, these, these young kids, they're being sold into for the debt of their parents. Now, our society, unfortunately, we do tend to start off with debt right away, which debt is a concern. Uh, we, we start off with debt right away because we have all these student loans, and that's kind of the, the way our society currently works. They're, those kids are going to have a hard time starting off with all kinds of issues from debt that they already have. But we're going to go forward and we're going to see his response to all this. He's upset with them. Why are you selling your brothers and sisters into slavery? And then they were silent and could not find a word to say. Again, I said, the thing which you are doing is not good. Should you not walk in the fear of our God because of the reproach of the nations, our enemies? And likewise, I, my brothers, and my servants are lending them money and grain. Please let us leave off this usury. So he's connecting good behavior with fearing God, right? So he's connecting that, understanding that God has more power than our enemies that we should be desiring to serve God more than we should be desiring to enrich ourselves. He's more important than material gain, and we should fear uh, disobedience to God more than we should fear hunger or being unpopular or missing out, any of those kinds of things. And Nehemiah was willing to set an example. Now, in the business world at the time, if you want to look at it that way, this might have been seen as foolish or naive. He's leaving money on the table and the fact that he's not charging usury, but he is following the Old Testament Levitical law here and is doing this to help others. Now, the reality is, is that sometimes as you follow Christ, you might leave money on the table. I'm not telling you to make bad business decisions. I'm not telling you to uh, run things in such a way that you give everything away. You need to be a good steward. That's a way that you can honor God. But in a, in a balanced sense, you need to make sure that you are serving other people, especially in our context, our fellow Christians. I can remember a time when uh, my parents had a little bit of a, uh, of a disagreement, we'll call it, over my dad selling a house at a pretty low cost when we were moving out of town. And my mom said, we could have gotten more. Why did you let them talk them down? And my dad said, well, they were young and they needed it. And we got enough. It was good enough. And part of me still doesn't understand that because I think, man, it would have been nice to have that little extra money. Even I know that. And then part of me does understand that because I have been the, the beneficiary sometimes of some amazing things because of a relationship that I have with Christ and the person giving me or selling me or, or buying from me or whatever, um, having, also having a relationship in Christ because the idea was, yeah, we're going to be fair, but we're also going to bless one another. And so sometimes we have to do that. So there's not a... a checklist. There is not a, a kind of uh, a sheet that we can go through. You know, we're going to have to handle that prayerfully in each instance. But Nehemiah, he was turning the tide by being an example. He saw that people were being un treated unfairly. He saw that this was not helping anybody. And thankfully, we already saw that he was equipped by the king who sent him. So he was not as in need as other people. He had that ability to, to freely give out in that way. And so he saw whatever he was given as a gift to then serve God by serving others, and he did so. And he's going to encourage others to follow in his example. Please give back to them this very day their fields, their vineyards, their olive groves, and their houses. Also the hundredth part of the money and the grain, the new wine and the oil that you are exacting from them. Then they said, 
we will give it back to them and will require nothing from them. We will do exactly as you say. So I called the priests and took an oath from them that they would do according to this promise. I also shook out the front of my garment and said, thus may God shake out every man from his house and from his possessions who does not fulfill this promise. It's nice when the Bible uses a physical illustration and then explains it to us. Even thus, he may be shaken out and emptied. And all the assembly said, amen. So they're agreeing to it. It's true. That's amen there. And then they praised the Lord. Then the people did according to this promise. Now for us as Christians, making promises and oaths can sometimes get a little complicated, right? We know that in Scripture, we're told to let our yes be yes or our no be no. Whenever I quote that, I grew up reading King James, and I always want to say yea be yea and you know, nay be. However you remember that, just remember we're supposed to say it and then do it. And James, the half-brother of Jesus, seems to echo this. But they write in a culture that didn't have written loans and things like that or written agreements and even Jesus did take an oath under the court of law as he was in his own trial. So this isn't all oaths or all agreements that are being done away with. It's this weird, elevated, pinky promise, kind of exaggerated, dramatic thing. Rather than do all that stuff, if you agree to do something, just do it. And if you're interested in digging in more, you know, that'll be next month's newsletter article that's already written as we, and I, hope, I do hope you read those newsletter articles, but we'll dig into kind of how this system, this society looked at covenants. For Nehemiah, this kind of covenant was very important. They couldn't just go to the local notary saying this together. They were trusting that God was overseeing this agreement and that it was a very serious agreement and there was details or, or punishments if they didn't actually follow through with the agreement. And so they're going to say they're going to do it. And then you know what? They did it. What a wonderful witness. That's the way things should be. If we say, I'm going to do it, we should do it. That's how we build consistency and faithfulness. That's how we can know we can build trust with other people and how we become trustworthy. And that's certainly what we want. God is watching. They knew it. And so they did it. Nehemiah was being patient and an example, and he's moving forward. Moreover, from that day, I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah. From the 20th year to the 32nd year of King Artaxerxes for 12 years, neither I nor my kinsmen have eaten the governor's food allowance. But the former governors who were before me laid burdens on the people and took, them, took from them bread and wine besides 40 shekels of silver. Even their servants domineered the people. But I did not do so because of the fear of God. Again, he connects with... His appropriate behavior with fear of God, respecting who God is and understanding he's really in charge, right? When I read this section, I'm aware that sometimes people have used this passage in an inappropriate way. I grew up in a few small country churches as a young Christian, and I re can recall one pastor of mine who was really, you know, I I'd served under another pastor, but this guy was really my first pastor. He was my mentor. I still think about the lessons he taught me today, and any ministry that I do, I think, is ultimately impacted greatly by the lessons I learned under him. But we came from different denominational settings and then served in a non-denominational church together, and I was his first youth leader, then associate. Um, but he came from a background that really elevated pastors having a secular job and receiving no money from the church. And there was a time that he had absolutely serious financial problems and a need. He, he had not been healthy. You know, I, I don't remember all the details of it, but he needed a certain item and he did not want the church to pay for it. And so while it wasn't inappropriate and go behind his back in one sense, I did get together the elders and say, hey, he has a need. It is appropriate. Paul says the laborer is worth his hire. We need to make sure that our pastor gets this need met. And so we did it. So I know that that impacts some churches where we expect people to do a lot of work for nothing. You know, and I wish that we could. I'm not, you know, this is odd that I'm the one talking about it, but I'm not the only one employed here. I would love to be able to pay our staff more. It's important because that pastor that I'm talking about, he couldn't do all that he could have been able to do for the church and serve in all the ways that he could have served had he not had to have a full-time job. Of course, I'm thankful because he had a full-time job, he needed me to fill in for him a whole lot. So I was kind of thankful for that. But it, you can see how there's a need there. On the other hand, we also see the error in the other way, right? It's not hard to go and find 
Facebook memes or things like that attacking these megachurch pastors and their mansions. No, a megachurch doesn't automatically, you know, we should view the doctrine in question or taught there, not the size. But we do see these, these people that are clearly living a lavish lifestyle and, and still yet trying to trick people into to giving them money and that kind of thing as if, it, as if they still need it in certain ways. And it's not even for advancing the kingdom because, see, that's what all that should be about. It should be about advancing the kingdom, changing lives, doing ministry more effectively. Nah, it becomes about them. And it turns our stomach. We've seen these kinds of things. And so I get nervous when I hear some of those things creep into other churches. And I want to be very careful. I think a healthy church, we're sharing the gospel with everybody, right? And there's going to be people in our midst that are blessed differently than us and have different giftings. And that's okay and that's good. God has, whatever he has given us, it should be something that we in turn give back to God and use to bless others. But there are definitely some errors here. And I've heard this particular passage used to encourage, frankly, what I think is just not treating church staff well. And I hope that you treat my fellow staff. I think you treat me very well. I hope you treat our fellow staff very well as well, continuing going forward. But did you catch what this is about? This is one of the reasons why I get frustrated with seeing this passage used this way. Nehemiah wasn't a priest. What was Nehemiah? governor. Well, yeah, slave before that. He was a governor in this instance. He's been pulled up as a governor. And so this cupbearer is now a political official. There was already a system in place to take care of the priests and the Levites. And so they were working and, and they were doing things. They were collecting money for that. He was concerned about overburdening the people with taxes And so I think we need to make sure that we understand what's being talked about here. Nehemiah wasn't using public service to fleece the flock. And unfortunately, we do see that today, both red and blue. We see career politicians make tons and tons and tons of money. As we try to be salt and light in a representative republic, I don't know exactly how we solve that, but I do hope that you pray about that and it influences the way you vote as we do that because we are called to do that. That is part of our rendering unto Caesar. Taxes are appropriate. We have to pay them. I get that. But I am suspicious of anybody who looks at people who are hurting and tries to get more money out of them rather than finding ways to serve them more effectively. And that's what Nehemiah is concerned about here. He's looking at his people. He was already blessed. He didn't need any more because he was blessed by the king. And he is going to lead by example and say, I'm not going to take more of their money when they don't have it to give. And he's going to lead truly as a servant. And we need more of those for sure. And so Nehemiah continued to lead by example because he's going to go. And even though he's going to be governor, he's still going to be a part of the construction on the wall. It's not like, oh, the people beneath me do that. He leads by example. He leads from the front lines. I also applied myself to the work on this wall. We did not buy any land. And all my servants were gathered there for the work. Moreover, there were at my table 150 Jews and officials, and this is part of his job as a governor, besides those who came to us from the nations that were around us. Now that which we was prepared for each day was one ox and six choice sheep. Also birds were prepared for me. And once in 10 days, all sorts of wine were furnished in abundance. Yet for all this, I did not demand the governor's food allowance because the servitude was heavy on this people." Remember me, O my God, for good, according to all that I have done for this people. So he entertained as appropriate for the governor. He lists things out very clear, like, like, here's what it is. Here's why I'm doing it. He's being very transparent. I appreciate transparency and leadership. And for you as an individual, wherever you find yourself, being transparent can be helpful. Being self-sacrificial can be God-honoring, right? We need leaders. My son is at Valley Life. My daughter's at Valley Life. And they they are raising up leaders. That's the whole point of their charter school is kind of the performing arts and leadership. They recognize that all those kids can one day be leaders. You don't have to have a high business position to be a leader. Wherever you find yourself having influence, you are a leader. And those whom you are leading, you can focus on blessing them and growing and maturing them as opposed to trying to 
lead their money into your pockets. Not that anybody else is doing that here or anybody's doing that here, but we know that that happens in the world, and it's frustrating when we see it. Now, Nehemiah closes with a call for God to remember him, for the good that he's doing. And I don't think this is a cry for special favors. I don't think this is something that he was doing, uh, some kind of admission like, I'm doing all this good work just because you're going to bless me. Certainly, God will remember even a lukewarm glass of water given in his name. So he knows that, but God is not some cosmic vending machine that you could put good works into and get blessings out of. No, instead, I think he is crying uh, with the same kind of attitude that is connected to the idea we see in Galatians 6, 9. Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. In the midst of serving God, it can be difficult when you see somebody else not play by the rules, not follow and, and be obedient, and they seem to have short-term success when instead you're trying to look for God and, and look and follow God and think about eternity. It can be frustrating when things don't seem to go your way, when in the moment it's hard and painful. But really, at the end of the day, we should trust that God is watching. God is in charge. And we should be working together in families, making sure that we are connected with one another, dealing with the issues as, as we find and uncover them, but that together we're glorifying God. As a church, making sure that we are glorifying God, moving forward together, dealing with all these things, and God will reward our faithfulness. He's called us to help rebuild a solid foundation right here in Visalia. He's called us to make influence around the world through things like the internet, but even through just training folks here and sending them out as they are going about their daily lives. We need to be faithful, and we not, don't need to let things like some of these background issues distract us or let people attacking one another distract us. We need to put that kind of stuff aside and start working together, just like Nehemiah had to deal with it and call everybody to get together and on the same page so that they could march forward in what God had called them to do. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to learn from Nehemiah and what he's doing in chapter 5. But we thank you for his example of servant leadership. Lord, we would ask that as we ultimately lead in some way or fa form or fashion, whether it be amongst our family, whether it just be among friends that we have influence over, or even if it be in a business or supervisory role, Lord, that you would help us to confront truth, uh, share truth, and glorify you in the way that we treat others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.